morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to worship this morning at Faith Lutheran. Uh, we continue our Lenten series, Because He Knew. Uh, because our Savior knew all that was ahead of Him, uh, He acted accordingly, and to His praise and glory, He then prepares us. That'll be our focus for worship this morning. Because He knew, He prepared His disciples. We'll see ourselves in the shoes of His disciples this morning. We'll follow the order of service uh, called Morning Praise, uh, an order of service that we haven't made use of in quite some time. Uh, the first song of that order is called the Morning Hymn, and so it'll be our first song this morning. The congregation is invited to stand. that may happen to our body and from all evil thoughts that assault our soul. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Our Old Testament reading this morning from Genesis chapter 28. Jacob is the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac, and he finds himself in a very uh, difficult position in life, estranged from his family, his parents, his brother. Uh, it is the Lord that reassures him and encourages him. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head, lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5. Uh, this is just a tremendous section of the book of Romans. Uh, the, the assurances that God gives us through faith in his son Jesus are just astounding here. And then what it means for each of us going forward to you know, all that's ahead of us in this life. Paul says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of our God. We'll sing now a uh, hymn 477, What is the World to Me? This hymn uh, sort of sets up the gospel message that we are about to hear. We'll sing three verses. <clears throat>
Please stand. The Gospel of our Lord for our consideration today is from Mark chapter 8. Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Then Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, dear friends in Christ. It's beautiful, isn't it? This symbol that is recognized really the, the whole world over. In fact, we've got a 20-foot one just on the other side of that wall, just outside, for our whole community to see. Can you count how many of them we have up here? Uh, there's the large one in the middle, there's the two on the banner, there's the one at the top of this flagpole, one on the altar, one on that banner. We even added another one at the altar for the season of Lent. And there's one right at the top of the baptismal fund, right over there. Some people have them hanging from their neck. Others have them have it tattooed even on their bodies. And it's beautiful. But it's also ugly, too, isn't it? It's ugly what it reminds us that what it meant for Jesus. And it's ugly that it reminds us of all the reasons that it did cause that for Jesus, all of our sin. And it's ugly that that's the cost that our sin took to be paid for. And it makes us kind of ugly, too. It makes us ugly in the eyes of the world when we are connected with it and associated with it, and we are viewed as weak because of it, ridiculed because of it, cast aside as irrelevant or unimportant or unwise because of it. It makes us unattractive to the world. It's an ugly thing. So, dear friends in Christ, which is it? Is it beautiful or is it ugly? We need our Savior Jesus to prepare his disciples, to prepare us, to answer that very question. That will be our focus this morning from Mark chapter 8. The first half of Mark's gospel, the first eight chapters, they're kind of all about what the season of Epiphany was about. They're all about presenting and revealing Jesus as Christ, the Son of the living God, at his baptism, in his miracles, healing and driving out demons, preaching and teaching with authority. And we heard all of that in the season of Epiphany. The last half of Mark's gospel, the last eight chapters, are really what the season of Lent is all about. That he resolutely makes his way to the cross. And it's really this text that is sort of the transition point between the two. This is the first time in Mark's gospel where, as we were just told, he began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And he spoke plainly about this. He was clearly preparing them for what was about to come. And it's interesting to note that this is not the only time that he says that to them. In the very next chapter, Mark chapter 8, or excuse me, Mark chapter 9, he says it again. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. And then in the very next chapter after that, chapter 10, he says it again. He took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. 
We're going up to Jerusalem. He said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Very clearly, Jesus is preparing them now for what is to come. And notice that he uses the word must. It must happen this way. It's everything that the Old Testament had set before them. In fact, uh, it's the same thing that God told Satan in the Garden of Eden. Uh, for Adam and Eve to listen to this promise that he, Jesus, will crush your head, Satan, and he will strike his heel. It must happen that way. All of the prophets uh, foretold it as well. Isaiah said, by his wounds we are healed. We'll be pierced for our transgressions and crush, crushed for our iniquities. It must happen the Psalms are full of it too. Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected will become the capstone. It must happen that way. And so Jesus very clearly tells his disciples, repeating what the Old Testament had set forth, it must happen this way. And why all the repetition? Why does he need to repeat it so many times? Well, by this time of Jesus, people had come to expect something very different from that Messiah they were waiting for. God's people used to have their own nation and their own kings and their own land and their own power and their own wealth. And having lost all of that, they wanted it back, of course. And they expected the Messiah, whoever he would be, to do that for them. Bring it all back to us, those good old days. What they had forgotten is that the whole reason God established them in the first place was to show them His grace and mercy in Christ. And to show it to them so that they in turn could show it to the whole world. That was the whole point God had established them in the first place. They instead wanted their own power back, their own nation, their own land they wanted it to be all about them. They expected something pretty different than what he had come to give them. And so it's all of that kind of thinking that really is behind what Peter says and what Peter does. Jesus spoke plainly about this, about his suffering, about his rejection, about his death. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. No, Jesus, that's not how it's supposed to go. How are you going to bring back the, the power to Israel if, if you're rejected? How are we going to overcome the Romans and get back into control if you suffer and die? It's not supposed to go that way, Jesus. Jesus wasn't who he thought he should be. Isn't the devil so clever? These people all had Jesus right there in front of them. The, the, the crowds, the disciples, the authorities, the, the religious teachers, they all had Jesus right in front of them, but it didn't matter if they expected him to be somebody else. If they expected him to do something different, it didn't matter who he was right there in front of them. If Jesus isn't going to deliver on what they want, then he's forgettable. You can ignore him. You can rebuke him. You can even crucify him. If he's not who you think he should be. And so Jesus says it so forcefully and so powerfully. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And can you just imagine the disciples' reaction to that? Can you imagine Peter's response to that? What did he just say? But what's amazing about that is not that Jesus is calling Peter Satan. What is it that Jesus is equating? That human concerns, human concerns of who Jesus should be and what he should do, or human concerns of how spiritual things should work in this world. And even those human concerns, even with the best intentions, as I'm sure Peter thought he had, the best intentions when he told Jesus what to do and what not to do. These human concerns, whatever they are, they aren't God's concerns. 
And if they aren't God's concerns, then where do they come from? Get behind me, Satan. Clearly, Jesus is preparing his disciples to know the difference between God's concerns and their own. Just this past week, I was driving, listening to the radio, and I came upon this, uh, this conversation, and I have no idea who the, the people were talking, and I, I don't even know the context of what they were talking about. But I just heard this little snap, this little snippet of this discussion, this back and forth. One person was sort of giving her life story. She said how she grew up in a Christian home, and, and according to her, she described it, we, her family, they followed the rules of what it meant to be a Christian. And then she said, growing up and leaving the house and going out on her own, she quickly realized that following Jesus' rules and the Bible's rules made it very hard for her to be who she wanted to be. And so she concluded that life is really just about being true to yourself and, and trying your best to love other people and that she didn't need Jesus or the Bible to do that. And the man that she was talking to applauded her and agreed with her. And it was this great thing. And I felt so bad for them both. Because those are not God's concerns. Those are merely human concerns. And it's so common, that thought and, and, and those ideas, uh, it's so widely applauded in the world. And I don't just mean right now in our day and age. It always has been. Christians are always being pulled in two directions, our concerns and God's. Believers in Christ, you and I, we are always struggling against this temptation that hides itself as a pretty good sounding idea. That we can follow Jesus and it doesn't have to be hard. And it doesn't have to mean that we need to sacrifice anything. It doesn't mean that we need to look different to anyone in this world. It doesn't have to have all those ugly things like sacrifices and losses and crosses. Isn't Satan so clever? Israel wanted to have all their power and all their, uh, their land and their nation back and they wanted Jesus to do it for them. And some of that thinking even came into the minds of Jesus' own disciples. And it's still in the minds of his disciples today. We want our Christian lives to be easy, to not have to sacrifice or lose anything for our faith. And we want Jesus to do that for us. Because in our minds, if it's beautiful to us, then it must be beautiful. And if it's ugly to us, then it must be ugly. Praise be to God. That his concerns are not ours. Praise be to God that the things of our human thinking are not the things of his thinking. We try so desperately and hard to avoid suffering in this life at all costs. And what did our Savior Jesus do? He came right for suffering at all costs. He must be rejected, he said. Because no human concern, no earthly thinking would ever accept him. He must be rejected. And he must suffer. Our sins demand it. And a holy God deserves to punish sin. He must suffer. And he must be killed. Because in order to be a savior, he must save us from something. The Bible tells us that the wages of our sin is death. And so he went there with the wages of our sin, and he died. And so it is the most beautiful thing that we will ever see, where all of our sin and where all of our guilt and where all of our human concerns, where our death itself went to die with him, so that we would be declared his forgiven people. At all costs. The beauty of Jesus' cross is replacing our human concerns with His. Through faith in His Son. 
the very things that God is concerned about. His highest concern, his greatest concern is saving you. Saving sinners from their sin. These are God's concerns. And nowhere do we see it more clearly and more powerfully than right there. Because he knew, he prepared his disciples. And he's still preparing us. Not just for what would happen to him, although that's part of it, clearly. But also what will happen for us. He prepares us ahead of time. Notice how this text sort of divides into those two sections. He says, this is what's going to happen to me. And then right away he says, this is what's going to happen to you. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wanted to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Maybe the people in that crowd, we don't know who they are. Maybe they're following Jesus and they don't really know why. Maybe they're wondering, uh, what do I want Jesus to do for me? I don't even know the answer to Maybe they were starting to think about, maybe it's time to just walk away. Maybe we find ourselves somewhere in that crowd in some way or another. Dear friends in Christ, don't hear this as another burdensome command that your Savior gives you. Some ugly thing to bear. But rather see it as the beautiful thing that it is. What could be greater than to deny our sinful selves and to instead find ourselves in Him, forgiven and set free from all the bondage of sin and death. That's what it means to deny ourselves and to take up our cross. To find that suffering for Him and for the message of the Gospel is our greatest joy. Remaining connected to Him. And He explains it even further for us so that we would understand. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the Gospel will save it. Because he knew that that would be our struggle. That that would be our daily dilemma. Because he knew he prepared us for it. The very struggle of our Christian lives. Life will either be gained or lost. And hear that again. Life will either be gained or it will be lost. And we find that in losing this life for his sake and for the message of our salvation, we find joy upon joy. We haven't lost anything. We've gained everything. To the ugliness of carrying a cross, to the pain of losing in this life, we can say, right, Jesus, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. And he's still not done. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? And this is my favorite verse 37 uh, in this text. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And I love it that he's the one who asks that question. The very creator of our soul, the one who breathed life into us, he asks that question. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Because he alone knows the answer. He gave himself for the salvation of our soul. He knows that that's the cost. That's the price. Anything less is never going to be worth it. Anything that this world has to offer doesn't come anywhere close to what he gave in exchange for our soul. And so, is it ugly? Or is it beautiful? And it's our Savior Jesus who has prepared us to answer that question. And so because he knew, so do we. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guards our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll sing a a hymn of praise uh, based on the message that we just heard. 465, Jesus, I, my cross, have taken. And we'll sing just two verses there. You may be seated.
there. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me. physicians and nurses, social workers and caring friends, all who feed the hungry, comfort the hurting, and sit beside the dying. Strengthen them in their work, O Lord, and do not let them become weary in doing good. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private prayers. Because you have purchased us to be your own with the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, we commit to your care, our body and soul, and all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome again, everyone, to worship today. Uh, pray that this uh, series would continue to be a blessing to us. Uh, uh, to just ponder all that Jesus knew ahead of time, all that was coming for him, uh, means that we are well prepared, well equipped for what is ahead of us. Uh, I wanted to take a couple minutes right now to watch the February Wells Connection. It's been quite a while since we've watched the Wells Connection in worship. Here is the uh, February edition. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. You're likely aware that Wells Christian Aid and Relief responds to events like hurricanes and tornadoes where a whole community is suffering. But another facet of the work focuses on tragedies that affect just a single family, personal grants that can make a life-changing difference for individuals in need. Lake Mills is a, a wonderful bedroom community. Has a lot to offer to families, not only in raising them, but also in the activities on the lake. St. Paul has played an important role in the history of the Lake Mills area. The church has always been there. That has been the constant. That doesn't go anywhere. The ability to go and share in God's word and pray together and ask people to pray for you. And it's a normal Wednesday night, and Landon had started screaming that he had a really bad headache, and it, was, and it was really bad. It was Ash Wednesday of 2019. It was during, I believe, uh, the time of our Lent service. Uh, he had the seizure. I'll never forget this, because it's embedded in my head. I told my brother-in-law, I said, call 911, something's really wrong here. It took him right to Children's Hospital in Madison. He had a massive brain bleed and it, his outcome was uncertain that he, if he was even going to make it alive after this. So Landon spent about 10 days he was in a coma. Is he going to wake up? How, how do you make this decision about your eight-year-old child and just like hope that it's going to work, you know? And then as time, you know, progressed and we were there for quite some time. I mean, Landon was there from March to September. It was very traumatic for everyone, especially when you see a young man go through such an experience, wondering whether or not he would survive this life. But we were also very confident that if that was the Lord's will, we knew that he would be in heaven with his Savior. At that time, he was, Lennon was not talking a lot of the time, but he went out of his way to tell the pastor to read him a Bible verse. We had made arrangements uh, that we as pastors would go to the house. I walked into his room, and the first thing he said to me is, Pastor, it's good to see you. Can you please read me a Bible story about Jesus? Read a Bible verse, because I wanted to remember Jesus. Jesus means that he died on the cross for all of us. What I loved about all of the pastors at St. Paul's is every single one of them reached out and they were like, what, what can we do to help you? Can we come and visit? Can we pray with you? Can we pray for you? What, does, what do you need from us? Well, when I realized you know, how much it was gonna cost uh, for the family to purchase a handicapped accessible van, which legally they had to do uh, to transport him, um, I knew that there was a way for us now to help them. And I found out about Christian Aid and Relief and how they can help in this way from another pastor. We do personal grants for people in our congregations who are just struggling in some aspect of life. Maybe they've got some uh, major medical bills uh, or some other financial challenge. And so we work together with congregations who contact us uh, to give those people some uh, financial uh, assistance that they need. It was just amazing, and our, and our congregation uh, to date has collected almost $20,000 to help pay for that van, and the balance was covered by Christian Aid and Relief. And without their help, I don't think that would have been possible. <laughs> it's 
always amazing how God finds another way to get you there or to answer a prayer you maybe didn't even know you had. And so we got the van. I mean, within six weeks, pastor was like, here you go, we've got this, we're gonna help you. It was the Lord who held them up and it was his strength that carried them through. And they regularly confessed that and that was beautiful. It's just so humbling. People who we have never met, never will meet here on earth, who were willing to help Landon and help us do the things that are most important is still to be able to travel together and um, ultimately it's to go back and have Landon worship his Savior in, in church. To see the relief, and I think that's what Christian Aid and Relief is all about, giving them the relief that they're not alone and that they have others they can count on. Landon's story is a beautiful illustration how Wells Christian Aid and Relief offers opportunities to demonstrate our Christian love. Whether it's a natural disaster, or a need at one of our world missions, or a family that's hurting, Wells Christian Aid and Relief is there as a way to show love to our neighbor, reflecting the great love Jesus has shown us. mentioned that uh, it's a way of uh, people that they don't even know to help them. Uh, we are some of those people. Uh, our CMO offerings that are a part of our yearly budget uh, help support Christian uh, aid and relief. Uh, so one of the many wonderful facets of our, of our synod and, and supporting it. Uh, looking ahead this Wednesday, uh, the Hands of the Passion, again, Wednesday night worship at 6.30. Pastor Brian Roloff from Ascension in Plymouth. The Hands of Misguided Zeal, uh, the focus on Peter. And I wanted to let everybody know that uh, next week uh, we'll, we'll get back into uh, Bible study. Uh, next Sunday, we're going to start uh, four weeks in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and so just a reminder of what the week will look like. Starting on Sunday, we're going to have a, a brief Bible study following worship. Uh, five to ten minutes that will sort of uh, you know, focus us, get the, the, the topic off the ground uh, here, right here after worship. And then that topic will be expanded in Zoom on Thursday and a recorded video that uh, people can make use of at home on their own at any time. Uh, and then also that same topic will be uh, put out through our small groups as well. So Bible study on a bunch of different platforms and times uh, so that it would hopefully Lord willing work for more people. If you have any questions about that, let me know. Uh, we won't be taking the whole Gospel of Mark. I've just pulled four texts out uh, to make four uh, specific points. So we ask that the Lord would bless us all in that uh, endeavor and Lord's blessings to all of you. It's his birthday today. Happy birthday, buddy. Thank you.